Hi, I'm Gareth Herschel. I'm a VP analyst here at Gartner. And today I'm going to talk about the five ways that you can scale your AI and Gen AI initiatives across your organization. Now we know that AI and Gen AI has taken the world of data and analytics and the world of business in general by storm. So it has been absolutely transformational across almost every organization and certainly across every industry and every geography. So it is absolutely something that your organization will need to be able to really address, really get good at. And hopefully these five suggestions will help you accelerate that process to greater success within your organization. Now we're going to talk more about this in breakout sessions, in keynotes, in roundtables, in workshops, and in peer networking sessions at our Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in Orlando in March. And I really hope you'll join us there. And you can find more information about that conference in the link um, associated with this webinar. So let's dive into what are five things you can do to really supercharge your AI and your Gen AI initiatives. Now, one thing I just do want to clarify, the first thing you can do is be very diligent or very specific in your language, right? AI and Gen AI are two different things. There's a connection, right? Gen AI is one type of AI, but there are other types of AI as well, right? There's compound hybrid AI, there's uh, agentic AI, there's decision intelligence, which is an aspect of uh, AI. So there are lots of different things that you should be thinking about. So I don't want you to automatically conflate AI and Gen AI as being the same thing, right? We see that a lot. It's like AI slash Gen AI. No, two different things. Gen AI is about generating new content based on a library of existing content, right? So it is a very specific set of capabilities and techniques that you would use in a broader set of AI initiatives. Now, all five of these ideas are things that you can do and apply to both AI and Gen AI, but just because you can apply them to both doesn't mean that you apply them in exactly the same way to both. And I'll try and draw out some of those differences and subtleties as we go through the process. But let's dive in. Um, so why do we even care about this? Now, I mentioned it's something that we're absolutely, you know, really focused on already. But why is that? Well, for one thing, we're spending money on it. <laughs> Nothing focuses organizational attention like the fact that you're spending money on it. And sooner or later, somebody's going to come back to you and say, well, what did we get? What did I get for my money? Now, only about 11% of organizations are centrally funding their entire AI and Gen AI initiative, right? Most organizations, it's a bit of a hybrid, some centralized funding, some funding coming out of business functions and teams. So in aggregate, there's about 25% of spend on AI and Gen AI is coming out of that centralized function. But in most cases, that's a bit of a hybrid mix. So you're looking for ways of reaching out to your colleagues. You're looking for ways of building coalitions and building a team as you go ahead with these AI and Gen AI types of initiatives. But what are the five things? So number one, always consider AI as an option. Right? Whenever you're thinking about a data and analytics initiative or any other kind of business initiative that may benefit, which is all of them, from data and analytics, then you want to think about, okay, how would we do this using AI, right? Or Gen AI, right? Different options. Some projects will be suitable for AI. Some projects will be suitable for Gen AI. Some projects, there may actually be a use case or a kind of an, an approach that you could follow, which would use either or both of those techniques. But bear in mind that they are two different things. So you might want to think about them as two separate ways, right? How would we do this using AI? How would we do this or other techniques with AI? How would we do this using specifically Gen AI? And I would also encourage you to think about a use case or an approach to doing this, sorry, where you don't use any AI or Gen AI at all, right? How would we have done this five years ago? Because now we have a bit of a level set uh, to compare what incremental benefit, what incremental opportunity, what potential power does AI or Gen AI give to us as we start to do this, right? How can we do things that we could never have done before? So I want you to think about AI or Gen AI for every single kind of use case you're thinking about, but I don't want you to automatically do every project with AI or Gen AI, right? That's stupid. <laughs> what you should be doing is using the right technique for the right project, right? This is the project, this is the technique that will serve us the best, right? It may be a dashboard. It may be a table, right? It may be a data visualization. It may be a Gen AI technique, right? So choose the right tool. One thing that I think most organizations are starting to get beyond, but certainly we've heard it a lot in the last couple of years, is I need a project, right? I need an AI project. The board wants to be seen to be doing something with AI. 
Um, and I think that's led to a lot of white elephants and a lot of wasted investments in organizations where they've spent money because they were desperate to kind of do something with AI, even if it wasn't really the best approach. So number one, think about AI, but don't always use AI as you think about your use cases and think about your investments. Number two, always be measuring, right? Always be measuring the impact of what you've done with your AI initiative. So there's a temptation very often we see where organizations are really good and really diligent about measuring the impact of pilot projects or a proof of concept. But then once the thing goes into deployment, they're kind of like, yeah, we, we've done that, right? It's out there, it's doing its thing. Let's continue. And now we'll think about other projects and other initiatives, which is a natural behavior, right? We kind of tend to be attracted to the kind of the new shiny opportunity. But I do want you to make sure that you're not just measuring it during that proof of concept kind of prior to full deployment. You need to keep measuring the impact after full deployment. Few reasons for that. Um, one of them is that this is going to keep costing you money, right? Most, especially Gen AI initiatives, tend to be things where you are renting the software effectively. So you are continually paying the money for this project. So if you're not continually measuring the benefits, right? If you just assume the benefits we are getting now are the same as the benefits we were getting at the, you know at the beginning you're probably not giving yourself enough credit to be learning new things and, and tapping into the potential of what this solution can do for you. Um, but you're also going to be hard pressed when somebody comes back to you and says, well, that just cost me 3 million in the last year. Prove to me in the last year that we got $3 million worth of benefit from this. You have to be able to prove that. So you need to keep measuring the ROI and the impact of your, of your investments. Even after the deployment, you can't just switch. That will also keep you honest about unintended kind of consequences. Now, some of those unintended consequences may be good ones, right? Wow, we suddenly found out these people are using this software in a way that we hadn't ever thought, and that's bringing us benefit. But it also makes you sensitive to kind of potential pitfalls or problems that you're starting to slip into, use cases where you never really thought somebody would use it that way, but actually they are, and that's going to cause you problems. So keep measuring, keep monitoring what people are doing um, with these investments um, in order to be successful. The other thing that I think we're, we're starting to see, and certainly organizations are expecting, is different types of benefits at different stages in the process. So very often when organizations start investing in these technologies, um, the headcount actually goes up, right? We're seeing surveys where organizations are, are hiring more people to help deploy these capabilities, to help establish these capabilities. Um, so there's, you know, they're opening up new lines of business within their organizations, they're hiring people. So in some cases, you know, headcount actually goes up, but let's just assume, you know, for argument's sake, it doesn't. And in most organizations, it, it's pretty flat, at least to start with. But the interesting thing is when we talk to organizations about headcount expectations, short term, it's flat, right? This isn't designed to get rid of people. Medium term, it starts looking like organizations are saying, yeah, actually in the medium term, maybe we don't need quite as many people as we have today. So again, one of the reasons to keep measuring the impact of this is that some of these benefits and some of these impacts may only become visible in the medium to long term. They're not the kind of benefits that you capture and, and recognize in the short term as you do this project. So number one, always consider AI as an option. Number two, always be measuring uh, and, and also communicating. Let me add a you know, 2B. 2B is and communicate, right? Don't just measure, that's 2A. 2B is communicate the impact, right? Sometimes we're not very good about, you know, blowing our own trumpets and, and kind of patting ourselves on the back for what we've done. You know, these are significant issues. Now, given the profile of AI, people are probably going to keep coming to you and asking you about it, but it doesn't hurt to go out there and, you know, kind of advocate for what you've done, prove the value and prove the value to different stakeholders in the way that will resonate with that particular stakeholder. Um, number three, governance. Now, um, governance is often a dirty word in organizations, right? Governance is the thing that holds us back. Governance is the thing that slows us down. Governance are the killjoys of our organization. Um, sometimes that's true, but that's really all examples of bad governance, right? What good governance should be doing is effectively empowering you and, you know, giving you the authority to go out and do things, right? To say, yes, this is okay. Yes, you can do that. You know, so some simple guidelines around governance, um, you know, having a list of things like, okay, pre-approved, you want to use AI or gen AI or anything else to do these things, you're good, right? You don't need to ask anyone, just go do it. Conversely, these are the things which are like flat out, you cannot do this, right? These are prohibited items. 
Now we're going to revisit that list every now and then, right? But these right now are prohibited. You know, we're concerned about security. We're concerned about ethics. We're concerned about privacy. You know, we're concerned about literacy and understanding. So these are the things that are prohibited. And then we've got that middle range of like, yeah, you can do this, but you have to ask permission first, right? And you're very clearly establishing and defining who you need to ask and why you need to ask those people, right? That's good governance, right? Good governance is about helping your organization make decisions in the fastest, most appropriate, most effective way possible, right? So go ahead and do this. Don't do this. If you want to do this stuff, go ask these people about it for these reasons, right? That's all the governance that's needed. Because if you have that good governance, you can accelerate what you're doing with AI and Gen AI into all sorts of new use cases, into all sorts of new opportunities, and really keep the organization focused on where the value is going to come from. So simple guidelines will enable your organization to innovate much more quickly and much more safely, right? It isn't safety and innovation shouldn't be trade-offs to each other, right? Good governance enables safe, safe innovation, right? It stops you going down blind alleys where at the end of the day, you kind of built this amazing thing and then the governance police come in and say, like, no, you shouldn't have done that. I don't know why you wasted the last six months trying to build that thing. Of course, we're not going to do it. So engage them early. One of the attributes, one of the surprising attributes to me at least of our surveys of very mature organizations, organizations that have done a lot and had a lot of success with AI and Gen AI in multiple different business units over an extended period of time is that the group Kind of the, the thing that was the most differentiating about those groups compared to everyone else was that they involved legal very early on in the process, right? Legal are not the bad guys in this case, right? You bring legal into the discussion from day one and you are bound to be much more successful in terms of getting effective AI deployments across the organization, delivering value as quickly and effectively as possible. So that was number three. Number four, make your data AI ready. A little bit of a, again, a nuance in here. Um, so I always have, if you want to kill, right, the AI initiative within your organization, right, if you just will absolutely want to kill that, that program, you hate the idea of AI, you're scared of it, you don't like it, whatever the reason is, here's the trick to say, uh, or this is what to say to make sure that AI doesn't happen in your organization. All we need to do, that's a great idea. Yeah, go ahead. Love it. Great use case. Absolutely awesome. Before you do that, let me just get the data ready. Right? Before you go ahead and do that, let me just make sure our data is AI ready. Because if you say, make our data AI ready, it sounds reasonable, right? It sounds like, well, of course we'd want to make sure our data is AI ready. You'll never be done, right? Nobody will ever agree on when the data is AI ready. It's like, measure, let me measure that piece of string, right? You never get to the end of it. There's always another thing you could do to fix and tweak and manage that data. So really what you're doing is you are understanding on a use case by use case basis, what does AI ready data mean in this specific case, right? What is the data? What is the data quality? What is the data accessibility? Where is the source of this data? How is it being used? All of the good questions, right? But there is no such thing as AI ready data across your organization because there is no such thing as AI across your organization, right? There are multiple use cases for AI. There are multiple definitions. Therefore, there are multiple definitions of AI ready data in your organization. Now, I'd add another little wrinkle to that around Gen AI, which is that when you start talking about Gen AI and AI ready data, really what you're talking about is AI ready content, right? The whole purpose of Gen AI is that it is learning from a corpus of information, right? A body of knowledge that it is available to, for it to learn from and draw inferences and patterns from, right? So usually when we talk about AI, we're talking, you know, generally about a lot of somewhat structured data, structured data, semi-structured data, right? But it's a lot of that, that kind of data. So we, it makes sense to say AI-ready data. But when you're talking about Gen AI, what you're really talking about is content, right? Text, images, video, content, which for a data and analytics team or a chief data and analytics officer may not be part of your traditional skill set, right? That may not be the thing you are used to managing, the thing you are used to accessing, the thing you are used to using. So you really need out to work out to, or reach out to the people in your organization who are very committed to you know, knowledge management, document management, information management, and bring them into this initiative. So when you start talking about AI-ready data and AI-ready data for specific AI use cases or gen AI use cases, you've got the right combination, right? And it's both, it's data and content to help drive uh, your initiative and scale it up and deploy it across your organization. Number five. 
segment your audience by attitude. We do a lot of thinking about how we deploy capabilities and how we deploy solutions um, across our organization. So um, usually we, we kind of often think about it by function, right? This is for the marketing people. This is how we'll sell it to HR. This is how we'll sell it to finance or how we'll sell it to supply chain. So how we sell it to, to different groups. Now, the thing that we need to think about here is not just sell, segmenting our audience by function or by skill set, right? Here's our experienced data scientists. Here's our experienced analysts. Instead, we're starting to think about how do we begin to drive this for people who have different attitudes? Because one of the interesting things we've seen about AI over the last many years is it generates quite often strong emotions in people, but vastly different emotions. Now, it's interesting, when you go back a few years uh, and we ask people, what do you think, what words you associate with data and analytics and AI? What we see is uh, people say, well, it's complex, but it's also fascinating. Right? It, it's, it's really weird. It's, it's an incredible thing. It's fascinating. Go back just a little bit, a couple of years, it's still complex, but it's impressive. Wow, have you seen what they've done? Have you seen that video? Have you seen that YouTube? Have you seen that thing? You see all these other people, right? It's, it's complex, but it's impressive. Now, in our latest survey of around kind of attitudes, it was complex and threatening. We've gone from complex and fascinating to complex and threatening in about four years. So what you're thinking about is within your organization, what are the attitudes of different people? Because you're going to have all of these attitudes, right? You're going to have people who think that it's a waste of time. You're going to think, have people who think it's the most amazing transformation in the history of the world, right? Or since the internet or something like that, right? So there are going to be some people who say like it's effective, it's convenient. And some people are going to be like, ah, it's a waste of time. So what you're really thinking about is appealing to them kind of at an emotional level, right? How do I communicate the power and the opportunity of Gen AI to somebody who thinks that it's threatening their job, right? Thinks that it's threatening their role. Because my story to them is obviously gonna be fundamentally different than somebody who thinks it's the greatest way to get a promotion and makes it, you know, make themselves successful in their role. They may be in the same function, they may have the same job title, they may have the same level of experience with data and analytics. They just have two different attitudes to this emerging technology. And you need to think about and recognize and understand what their attitude is so that you are able to communicate effectively to them about this potential. Because increasingly we are, as we grow, you know, AI and gen AI across our organization, so it's increasingly pervasive, we're moving away from the early adopters, right? We're moving away from the people who are predisposed to want this, and we're trying to enter and sell to those groups who have always been a little bit, like, I'll let somebody else do this first, or hopefully I'll retire before I have to learn how to do that thing, right? We're expanding our audience, so you need to segment and understand your audience. Now, I hope these five things have been interesting for you. I hope they've been a little bit provocative for you. I hope that they've given you some things that you can take back and use to help drive the adoption of AI and Gen AI across your organization because it is truly transformational what it is achieving. Um, and I hope you will join us in Orlando in March to hear more about different use cases, the opportunities, and in particular, the best practices to make sure this works for you and your teams in your organization so you can transform your industries. Thank you all very, very much. Mm -hmm.